The Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, by William Shakespeare. Act Two, Scene One. A room in Polonius's house. Enter Polonius and Rinaldo. Give him this money and these notes, Reynaldo. I will, my lord. You shall do marvels wisely, good Reynaldo, before you visit him, to make inquire of his behaviour. My lord, I did intend it. Marry, well said, very well said. Look you, sir, inquire me first what danskers are in Paris, and how, and who, what means, and where they keep, what company, at what expense, and finding by this encompassment and drift of question that they do know, my son, come you more nearer than your particular demands will touch it. Take you, as twere, some distant knowledge of him, as thus, I know his father and his friends, and in part him. Do you mark this, Reynaldo? Ay, very well, my lord. And in part him, but, you may say, not well, but if be he, I mean he's very wild, addicted so-and-so, and there put on him what forgeries you please. Very none so rank as may dishonour him— take heed of that, but, sir, such wanton, wild, and usual slips, as are companions noted and most known to youth and liberty. As gaming, my lord. Aye, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarrelling, drabbing, you may go so far. My lord, that would dishonour him. Faith, no, as you may season it in the charge, you must not put another scandal on him, that he is open to incontinency, that's not my meaning, but breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty, the flash and outbreak of a fiery mind, a savageness in unreclaimed blood, of general assault. But, my good lord— Wherefore should you do this? Aye, my lord, I would know that. Marry, sir, here's my drift, and I believe it is a fetch of warrant, you laying these slight sullies on my son, as twere a thing a little soiled i' the working, mark you. Your party in converse, him you would sound, having ever seen in the prenominate crimes the youth you breathe of guilty. Be assured, he closes with you in this consequence, good sir, or so, or friend, or gentleman according to the phrase or, or the addition of man and country. Very good, my lord. And then, sir, do, does a this, a, a does... What was I about to say? By the mass, I was about to say something. Where did I leave? At closes in the consequence, at friend or so, and gentleman. At closes in the consequence. Aye, marry. He closes thus. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday, or t'other day, or then, or then, with such and such, and, as you say, there was a gaming there, or took in's rouse, there falling out at tennis, or, or perchance, I saw him enter such a house of sale, videlice, a, a brothel, or so forth. See you now, your bait of falsehood takes this carp of truth, and thus do we, of wisdom and of reach, with windlasses and with assays of bias, by indirections, find directions out. So, by my former lecture and advice, shall you, my son. You have me, have you not? My lord, I have. God be we, fare ye well. Good, my lord. Observe his inclination in yourself. I shall, my lord. And let him ply his music. Well, my lord. Farewell. Exit Rinaldo. Enter Ophelia. How now, Ophelia? What's the matter? Oh, my lord, my lord, I have been so affrighted. With what, in the name of God? My lord, as I was sewing in my closet, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded, and down jive to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking together, and with a look so piteous in purport as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors. He comes before me. Mad for thy love? My lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand thus o'er his brow, he falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Long stayed he so. At last, 
a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus, waving up and down. He raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go, and with his head or his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, for out of doors he went without their helps, and to the last bended their light on me. Come, go with me. I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent property foredoes itself, and leads the will to desperate undertakings, as oft as any passion under heaven that doth afflict our natures. I am sorry. What, have you given him any hard words of late? No, my good lord, but as you did command, I did repel his fetters and denied his access to me. That hath made him mad. I am sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle, and meant to rack thee, but beshrew my jealousy. By heaven, it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions, as is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. Come, go we to the king. This must be known, which— being kept close, might move more grief to hide than hate to utter love. Come. Exeunt. Scene two. A room in the castle. Enter King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and attendants. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation, so call it, Sith nor the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was. What it should be, more than his father's death, that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself, I cannot dream of. I entreat you both, that being of so young days brought up with him, and Sith so neighboured to his youth and haviour, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time, so by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather, so much as from occasion you may glean, whether aught, to us unknown, afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he hath much talked of you, and sure I am two men there are not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and good will as to expend your time with us a while, for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as befits a king's remembrance." Both your majesties might, by the sovereign power you have of us, put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. We both obey, and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our service freely at your feet, to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz, and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern, and gentle Rosencrantz, and I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you— and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye, amen. Exunt, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and some attendants. Enter Polonius. The ambassadors from Norway, my good lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still hast been the father of good news. Have I, my lord? Assure you, my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious King. And I do think, or else this brain of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do, that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that. That do I long to hear. Give first admittance to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. Thyself do grace to them, and bring them in. Exit Polonius. He tells me, my dear Gertrude, he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the main, his father's death, and our or hasty marriage. Well, we shall sift him. Re-enter Polonius with Voltamand and Cornelius. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voltamand, what from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. Upon our first he sent out to suppress his nephew's levies, which to him appeared to be a preparation against the Pollock. 
but better looked into he truly found it was against your highness whereat grieved that so his sickness age and impotence was falsely borne in hand since out arrests on fortinbras which he in brief obeys receives rebuke from norway and in fine makes vow before his uncle never more to give the essay of arms against your majesty whereon old norway overcome with joy gives him three thousand crowns in annual fee and his commission to employ these soldiers so levied as before against the pollock with an entreaty herein further shown giving a paper that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for this enterprise on such regards of safety and allowance as therein are set down it likes us well and at our more considered time well read answer and think upon this business meantime we thank you for your well-took labour go to your rest at night we'll feast together most welcome home exeunt voltimand and cornelius this business is well ended my liege and madam to expostulate what majesty should be what duty is why day is day night is night and time is time were nothing but to waste night day and time therefore since brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes i will be brief your noble son is mad mad call i it for to define true madness what is but to be nothing else but mad B but let that go more matter with less art madam i swear i use no art at all that he is mad tis true uh, tis true tis pity and pity tis tis true <laughs> a foolish figure but farewell it for i will use no art mad let us grant him then and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect <laughs> or rather say the cause of this defect for this effect defective comes by cause thus it remains and the remainder thus uh, perpend i have a daughter have while she is mine who in her duty and obedience mark hath given me this now gather and surmise reads to the celestial and my soul's idol the most beautified ophelia <laughs> that's an ill phrase a vile phrase beautified is a vile phrase but, but you shall hear thus reads in her excellent white bosom these etc came this from hamlet to her good madam stay a while i will be faithful reads doubt thou the stars are fire doubt that the sun doth move doubt truth to be a liar but never doubt i love o oh, dear ophelia i am ill at these numbers i have not art to reckon my groans but that i love thee best o oh, most best believe it adieu die never more most dear lady while this machine is to him hamlet this in obedience hath my daughter shown me and more above hath his solicitings as they fell out by time by means and place all given to mine ear but how hath she received his love what do you think of me as of a man faithful and honourable i would fain prove so but what might you think when i had seen this hot love on the wing as i perceived it i must tell you that before my daughter told me what might you or my dear majesty your queen here think if i had played the desk or table book or given my heart a winking mute and dumb or looked upon this love with idle sight what might you think no i went round to work and my young mistress thus i did bespeak lord hamlet is a prince out of thy star this must not be and then i prescripts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort admit no messengers receive no tokens which done she took the fruits of my advice and he repulsed a short tale to make fell into a sadness then into a fast then to a watch thence into a weakness thence to a lightness and by this declension into the madness wherein now he raves and all we mourn for do you think tis this 
It may be. Very likely. Hath there been such a time, I would fain know that, that I have positively said, "'Tis so, when it proved otherwise? Not that I know. Pointing to his head and shoulder. Take this from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstances lead me, I will find where truth is hid, though it were hid indeed within the centre. How may we try it further? You know sometimes he walks for hours together here in the lobby? So he does indeed. At such a time I'll loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an arras then. Mark the encounter. If he love her not, and he not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for a state, but keep a farm and carters. We will try it. But look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you both away. I'll board him presently. Oh, give me leave. Exunt, King Claudius, Queen Gertrude, and attendants. Enter Hamlet, reading. How does my good lord Hamlet? Well, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent well. You are a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? Ay, sir, to be honest, as this world goes, is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. For if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a god-kissing carrion, have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. Aside. How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter. Yet he knew me not at first. He said I was a fishmonger. He is far gone, far gone. And truly in my youth I suffered much extremity for love. Very near this. I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words. Words. Uh, words. What is the matter, my lord? Between who? I mean, the matter that you read, my lord. Slanders, sir. For the satirical rogue says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber and plum-tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit, together with most weak hams, all which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down, for yourself, sir, should be as old as I am, if, like a crab, you could go backward. Though this be madness, yet there's a method in it. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave. Indeed, that is out of the air. Aside. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. A happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered of. I will leave him, and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My honourable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot so take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all. Except my life. Except my life. <laughs> Except my life. Fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. Enter Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. You go to see the lord Hamlet. There he is. To Polonius. God save you, sir. Exit Polonius. My honoured lord. My most dear lord. My excellent good friends. How dost thou, Gildenstern? Ah, Rosencrantz, good lads, how do you both? As the indifferent children of the earth. Happy in that we are not over-happy. On fortune's cap we are not the very button. Nor the soles of her shoe. Neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist, or in the middle of her favours? Faith, her privates we. In the secret parts of fortune. <laughs> oh, most true, she is a strumpet. What's the news? None, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. Then is doomsday near. 
But your news is not true. Let me question you more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord. Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one. A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. We think not so, my lord. Why, then, tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me it is a prison. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, God! I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams, indeed, are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. A dream itself is but a shadow. Truly, and I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality, that it is but a shadow's shadow. Then are our beggars' bodies, and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars' shadows. Shall we to the court? For by my fay I cannot reason. We'll, we'll wait, wait upon, upon you. you. No such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants. For to speak to you like an honest man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in thanks. But I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear a halfpenny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, deal justly with me. Come, come, nay, speak. What should we say, my lord? Why, anything but to the purpose. You were sent for. And there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to colour. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you, by the rights of our fellowship, by the consonancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear a better proposer could charge you with all, be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. Aside to Guildenstern. What say you? Aside. Nay, then, I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery, and your secrecy to the king and queen molt no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air. Look you. This brave, o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof, fretted with gold and fire. Why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty and form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Men delights not me. No, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. My lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh, then? When I said, man delights not me. To think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what Lenten entertainment the players shall receive from you. 
"'We coated them on the way, and hither they are coming, to offer you service.' "'He that plays the king shall be welcome. "'His majesty shall have tribute of me. Uh, the, "'The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. "'The lover shall not sigh gratis. "'The humorous man shall end his part in peace. "'The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickled o'er the sair. And the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall heart for it. What, what players are they? Even those you were wont to take delight in, the tragedians of the city. How chances it they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. I think their inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. Do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are they so followed? No, indeed, they are not. How comes it? Do they grow rusty? Nay, their endeavour keeps in the wanted pace, but there is, sir, an airy of children, little Iasses, that cry out on the top of question, and are most tyrannically clapped for it. These are now the fashion, and so berettle the common stages, so they call them, that many wearing rapiers are afraid of goose-quills, and dare scarce come thither. What, are they children? Who maintains them? How are they escorted? Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? Will they not say afterwards if they should grow themselves to common players, as it is most like, if their means are no better, their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession? Faith, there has been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds it in no sin to tar them to controversy. There was, for a while, no money bid for argument— unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in the question. Is it possible? Oh, there has been much throwing about of brains. Do the boys carry it away? Aye, that they do, my lord. Hercules and his load, too. It is not very strange, for mine uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mose at him while my father lived give twenty, forty, fifty, uh, an hundred ducats apiece for his picture in little... Splat, there is something more in this than natural, if philosophy could find it out. Flourish of trumpets within. There are the players. Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands come, then. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in this garb, lest my extent to the players, which I tell you must show fairly outward, should appear more like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. But my uncle, father, and aunt, mother, are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north-north-west, when the wind is southerly. I know a hawk from a hen-saw. Enter Polonius. Well be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Guildenstern, and you too. At each ear a hearer. A great baby you see there is not out of his swaddling clouts. Happily he is the second time come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. I will prophesy he comes to tell me of the player's market. You say right, sir. Oh, Monday morning, twas so indeed. My lord, I have news to tell you. My lord, I have news to tell you. When Rocius was an actor in Rome... The actors are come hither, my lord. Buzz, buzz. Upon mine honour. Then came each actor... On his ass. The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical, historical pastoral, scene individual or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. For the law of writ and the liberty, these are the only men. Oh, Chep, the judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou! What treasure had he, my lord? Why, one fair daughter, and no more. The which she loved passing well. Aside. Still on my daughter. Am I not in the right, old Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. Nay, that follows not. What follows, then, my lord? Why— as by lot, God, what? And then, you know, uh, it came to pass 
as most like it was. Ah. The first row of the pious Jensen will show you more, for look where my abridgment comes. Enter four or five players. You are welcome, masters, welcome all. I am glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Oh, my old friend. Thy face is valence, since I saw thee last. Comes thou to beard me in Denmark? <laughs> what, my young lady and mistress? By your lady. Your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last, by the altitude of a Chopin. Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, be not cracked within the ring. Masters, you are welcome all. We'll e'en to it, like French falconers, fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my lord? I heard thee speak a speech once, oh, but it was never acted, or if it was, mm, not above once. For the play, I remember, please not the million, t'was caviar to the general. But it was, as I received it, and others, whose judgment in such matters cried in the top of mine, an excellent play, well digested and seen, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember... One said there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savoury, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of, of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome, as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One speech in it I chiefly loved. T'was Aeneas' tale to Dido, and thereabout of it, especially where he speaks of uh, Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, uh, begin at this line. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Um, the rugged uh, purist, like the Hyrcanian beast. No, it is not so. Ah, it begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, uh, he whose sable's arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble where he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal, head to foot. Now is he total gulls, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets that lend a tyrannous and damned light to the Lord's murder, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus or sighs with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish purest old grandsire Priam speaks. Ah, so proceed you. For God, my lord, well spoken, and with good accent and good discretion. Anon he finds him, striking too short at Greeks, his antique sword rebellious to his arm lies where it falls. Repugnant to command, unequalled matched, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, and rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow with flaming top, stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus's ear, for lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of reverend Priam, seemed to the air to stick. So as a painted tyrant Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing." But as we often see, against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold winds speechless, and the orb below as hush as death. Anon the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So, after Pyrrhus's pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work. And never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars's armor, forged for proof a turn, with less remorse than Pyrrhus's bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune! All you gods in general synod take away her power, break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven as low as to the fiends. This is too long. It shall to the barbers with your beard. Prithee, say on, he's for a jig or a tail of baudry, or he sleeps. Say on, c come to Hecuba. But who, oh, who had seen the mobled queen? The mobled queen? That's good. Mobled queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flames with bison room. A clout upon that head where late the diadem stood, and for a robe about her lank and all o'er loins, a blanket, in the alarm of fear caught up. 
who this had seen with tongue and venom steeped against fortune's state would treason have pronounced but if the gods themselves did see her then when she saw pyrrhus make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs the instant burst of clamour that she made unless things mortal moved them not at all would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods look where he has not turned his colour and has tears in his eyes prithee no more tis well i'll have thee speak out the rest soon good my lord will you see the players well bestowed do you hear let them be well used for they are the abstract and brief chronicles of the time after your death you were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live my lord i will use them according to their desert god's bodkins man much better use every man after his desert and who should scape whipping Use them after your own honour and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Uh, follow him. Friends, we'll hear a play to-morrow. Exit Polonius with all players but the first. Dost thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzago? Aye, my lord. We'll hat to-morrow night. You could, for a need, uh, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines, which I would set down and insert int, could you not? Aye, my lord. Very well. Follow that lord, and look you, mock him not. Exit first player. My good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, my lord. Aye, so God be with ye. Exeunt Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, <laughs> for Hecuba. <laughs> What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do, had he the motive and cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears, and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metalled rascal, peak like Jonah dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. Oh, not for a king upon whose property and most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pate a cross? Plucks off my beard and blows it in my face? Tweaks me by the nose? Gives me the lie, the throat, as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this? Ha! <laughs> Swoons. I should take it. For it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered, And lack gall to make oppression bitter. Oh, ere this, I should have fatted all the region's kites With this slave's awful. Bloody. Body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain of vengeance. Oh, oh, why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father, murdered. Prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, Must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words, And fall a-cursing like a very drab scullion. Fie upon't foe. 
about my brain. Ah, oh, I have heard. The guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tend him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. A spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. Oh, I'll have grounds more relative than this. The place, the thing, wherein... I'll catch the conscience of the king. Exit. End of Act Two.